Um, my name is Brian Gutierrez, and um, I am a program manager for our one of uh, several of our professional programs with UW Continuum. And under that tent is our Osher Lifelong Learning Institute. Um, and I've been with Continuum for about uh, a little over four years. Um, I'm stepping in today for our director, Natalie Letcher. I was director of the Osher Institute, just to do this brief introduction. But I really want to welcome um, both new and um, longtime members and just remind everyone that uh, Osher does offer, the Institute just offers um, you know, short academic programming for people over 50 years of age throughout the state of Washington, right? Well, again, welcome. Thank you for joining us today. Um, and I'd like to quickly introduce you to the two instructors that we have today, uh, Kristen Atberry, and she's the director of the Native Bee Research, and Stefan Clausen, uh, Native Bee Research and Volunteer Coordinator. So they talk about our Native Bees of Washington State and their Native Bee Research Initiative, CCUWB at UW Bothell and Cascadia College. I'll turn it over to the two of you. Hello, well, welcome everybody. We're so excited to be able to speak with you today about bees and in general native bees. Um, as we said, uh, I'm Stefan Klassen. Uh, my pronouns are he and him. I'm the Assistant Director of Sustainable Practices. And you know, we'll be talking about different bees uh, and what we do with bees on our campus and here in Western Washington. Uh, Kristen, do you want to introduce yourself too? Absolutely. Uh, my name is Kristen Atterbury. My pronouns are she and her. Um, I've been researching bees on campus uh, since 2017, and I'm really excited to share today all of the things that we've learned so far. Um, sit back and buckle up, and I'm really excited to share all of this. So, yeah. Let's see if I can get all this to work. Boop. Okay, so the first thing that we're going to talk about today is some morphology, so some physical traits that are going to identify some bees out in the wild. So there are three different kinds of insects that are often um, kind of mistaken for bees. So there's bees and there's flies and there's wasps. And all of those insects are often found on flowers and gardens and out and about. Um, and they're all kind of identified as pollinators. Um, but only bees carry pollen. So that's a sure sign. If you see a, a insect flying around, it's got a whole bunch of pollen on it. It's probably a bee. Um, bees are also identified. They have long antenna with a bend in them usually. And they have them on the outside of their heads. So they kind of look like eyebrows sticking out, which they're really cute. Um, they're more robust, so they're kind of like little round, little fuzz balls, and they're really nice. Um, they don't have quite as much of a waist. I'm sure you've seen a wasp with a really skinny waist. They kind of look like a little ballet dancer, um, but bees are generally more robust than that. They kind of have, you know, they're a little less skinny. Um, the our eyes are a little bit larger and they're located on their side of their head. They're often very almond shaped, which is a good sign that that's a bee. Um, bees actually have two pairs of wings and they fold them down and so sometimes it's hard to see, it's hard to tell, um, but sometimes when they're flying around you can tell that they have the two pairs. And something that you can kind of tell once you've been really, you know, being paying attention to the bees in your yard and you're really familiar with, yes, that's a bee, you'll notice that bees fly really purposely. They, they, they're looking for flowers really intentionally when they're foraging and, and they don't really hover. They don't really have that ability to kind of look in one spot. And so they'll kind of do this meandering look. Um, they don't really stay in one spot in the air. So if you see a, an animal or an insect just sort of sticking in one spot, that's probably not a bee. So moving on to flies. Flies are another insect in your garden that you might mistake for a bee and for good reason. Um, something that you can do to differentiate a fly from a bee is their antenna. That's the first thing I notice personally. I don't know what it is, but fly antenna gross me out a little bit. All insects are wonderful. They have their place on the earth and they all have their purposes, but I don't know. They just gross me out a little bit, that's just me. But they have this little Y-shaped antenna and they come out of their little tippy face of their nose, like their, their noses. 
And it's again, this little Y, they're short and stubby. They're really thick little antenna. So they don't have those lovely arching eyebrows. So that's one really quick way you can be like, oh, right away, that's not a bee, that's a fly. So if they have that little stubby Y-shaped nose, definitely not a bee. Their eyes are huge and they're more shaped on the front of their head. And they're so big that sometimes they even like converge together, like on the top of their face. So they have one giant eyeball kind of just sort of merged together on top. Um, they're even more robust in their bodies than bees. And they often don't have any kind of discernible waist at all. Um, so they kind of just sort of look like little flying, you know, bowling balls just flying through the air. Um, and they only have one pair of wings. So if you can see and you're, you're really positive that, oh, these, there's only one pair of wings there, that's a definite sign that that is only, you know, fly, definitely not a bee. Flies can hover. And so if you're looking at an insect and it is just staying in place, that is definitely a fly. So that is definitely something that flies can do and bees cannot. Flies hover. Um, flies are hairy sometimes, but they're less hairy than bees. And again, only bees intentionally carry pollen. And so if you see pollen on a bee, or sorry, pollen on a fly, my apologies, if you see pollen on a fly, it's just sort of accidentally carrying it around. And so flies are pollinators. It's important to know that flies do pollinate, but it's just sort of an accidental, they kind of carried it over here and it just happened that way. And it's very important also to know that there are many flies that very effectively mimic bees. And they do that because bees, I mean, they're kind of like, you want to avoid them. They sting, you know, they're, they're not so appetizing. You don't want to, you don't want to mess with a bee, right? And so the flies have figured this out. They're like, oh man, you know, the bees aren't something to mess with. And so over time, they've kind of evolved to look like bees. And so, you know, don't mess with them. You don't mess with me, right? And so sometimes it'll be really difficult. You know, even though I've been researching bees since 2017, I'll still be like, oh, look at this. Look at this bee I've never seen before. And I'll follow it around and I'll be looking at it. Oh, what? the fly and I'll just be you know so so rude come on and nope so very effective mimics it's it's kind of incredible how good they are so moving along so wasps are another insect that you'll see on flowers in your garden I want to dispel the myth wasps 99% of the time want nothing to do with you and they will fly away as soon as you come along there are like three wasps out there. There's paper wasps, there's yellow jackets, and there's mud daubers. And pretty much other than that, they'll leave you alone. Um, so if you see a wasp in your yard, unless it's coming at you, just be calm and it'll probably leave you alone. It's just wanting to get some nectar. It's just hungry. So like bees, antenna have long and or Wasps have long antenna with a bend, and they also have them positioned like eyebrows. Wasps have that really exaggerated waist, like I was talking about before. And sometimes it can be a really long, crazy waist. Wasps have some really interesting morphology depending on the, the type of species and, and what they're used for or the type of what they've evolved to do. Their eyes are also on the side of their head. Um, and generally they're not hairy, really at all. Um, and like flies, they only carry pollen accidentally. Like bees, they have two sets of wings. Um, so it can be kind of complicated when you're looking um, at bees versus wasps. There's lots of times that we make mistakes and we you know, identify them wrong. Um, but something that is pretty consistent in a, in a lot of people, um, when you're looking at a wasp compared to a bee, there, there's triggered an angry looking feeling in a wasp. It's, they, they look kind of rude. They look angry. And uh, there's a very armored kind of feeling to them. And, and it's a very consistent feeling. So if you get that kind of ugh, feeling, then it very, might, very likely might be a wasp. So something to consider.
and moving along. So this is a very interesting thing. So we have both native bees and non-native bees around here. Um, there are a total of seven bee families in the world, um, and we have five locally. Um, and they all have different pollination uh, preferences. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, um, Stefan, do you have any comments that you want to join in here? <clears throat> well, um, just to clarify, too, when we say families, right, this isn't species necessarily. There's thousands of species of yeah. bees in the United States alone. Um, and so we track down to something called morpho groups, which we'll cover uh, a little later in the presentation. Um, and then, as, as Kristen was saying, right, we have different uh, pollination methods, right? There's different times of pollination. There's different flowers they seek out. <clears throat> there's different, I mean, life cycles for each of the bees. So they have to track different types of flowers throughout the year. And so we'll, we'll cover all that a bit more, too. Mm -hmm. um, well, the last point, too, we want to really kind of feature and focus on is that we, we really want to try and appreciate and respect all bees. A lot of times people learn about bees and then be less happy about honeybees or less ha happy about like different types of species of bees. When really all bees and, and pollinators in general are very important for our crops, for our plants, for our flowering uh, ornamentals. And so it's something we want to make sure that you know people understand this is something important that we want to try and protect and support bees where possible. Uh, so just for the tracking and research on our campus, uh, we're in uh, Bothell, Washington. So we're just at the top part of Lake Washington, for those that don't know. Um, we track and follow morpho groups. So this is a, a categorized group of bee uh, species together. So like bumblebees is one morpho group, is one example. Uh, species are often very difficult to identify. Bees fly very quickly. They don't often, as we said, as Kristen said, uh, they fly purposefully, so they're not always sticking around very long. Uh, and so, especially since we're a citizen science-based project, uh, training is very difficult to identify bees versus wasps versus flies, much less down to the species level. Um, so we primarily track morpho groups, and uh, we'll be going over that next. Um, we try and use our work and efforts to support our activities and grounds use. Um, our grounds manager is very uh, receptive to hearing about what sort of bees are in the area, what sort of areas need more specific types of flowers and plants, and we've done a variety of projects protecting and supporting pollinators across our campus that way. Uh, as we said in the intro, we're CCUWB, so it's a, a combination of both our college and University of Washington Bothell campus together, uh, and so we've worked to get a B Campus USA certification. Uh, we can take questions about that at the end if someone, if anyone's interested, but it's a certification for um, areas, habitats, campuses uh, to support and protect pollinators. Uh, a second certification our campus has is a uh, national wildlife habitat certification, which protects all animals and creates open wildlife habitat spaces, which is really something special for a UW campus in it alone, because if you've been to you know, the Seattle campus or Tacoma campus, they're relatively urban areas. They're not really have options to be national wildlife habitats. And so our campus is rather special that even though we're surrounded by highways, we have urban wildlife spaces. Um, and then we've been pesticide and herbicide free. Our campus is completely pesticide and herbicide free since 2005. So we have found natural ways and permaculture methods of, of gardening and grounds care and keeping uh, that our grounds team has really focused on to stay this way, to protect our bees, to protect pollinators and other insects, and so also to reduce any other you know, runoff or damages that these sort of chemicals produce. Our research is split into two separate uh, studies, and both of them have been great in engaging students on campus. Um, the citizen science methods that we use have been great at plugging in just anybody who would like to join. Um, we use the morpho groups because it's just so easy to train people and they can plug in right away. Um, and it just makes things so simple. I mean, bees are something, I mean, people train for for years and years and years and years and years and some bees are just nearly impossible to identify without a microscope and a dissection tools like so being able to you know break these very complicated identify taxonomy uh traits into simple groups has been you know, instrumental and very valuable to us in being able to get meaningful results in ways that people are able to plug into and feel 
good about and it's just been a very very satisfying way that we've been able to both help our campus as well as you know actually make meaningful research so it's it's been a very a very good time and i'm excited to share the rest of this with you oh good so I want to talk first about the morpho groups, um, and we'll talk about uh, each morpho group in, in specific. So there's eight of them, um, and they're based on the, those physical traits. Um, so we talk a lot about um, pretty much these, these specifics. Um, we talk about what kind of pollen carrying mechanism they use. Um, there's two specific kinds, and they're based on where they are on their body. So if they have, you know, it spit, are they on their leg? Are they on their abdomen? You know, what kind on their leg? Um, what kind of colors do these bees come in? What size are the bees? Um, if the bees are one species, do those one species of bees come in different colors? Do they show dimorphism within that same species? Um, what are the general shape and size of those bodies? Is Are they very robust? Are they narrow bodied? So we have a lot of questions that we look at these bees and we sort them into these groups because again, when a bee is flying around and you've never really learned about bees and you're looking at it, you're like, I think that's a bee, but I don't really know what it is. Being able to put it in one of these eight categories, again, is very helpful for us as researchers and, and them as researchers, as, as citizen science researchers, um, and to get, again, this valuable data. So I'm going to start with, again, the pollen carrying mechanism is one of the things we look at first. Um, and one of the pollen carrying mechanisms is called corbicula. Um, and it's also known as a pollen basket. Um, bumblebees and honeybees are the only bees that have pollen baskets. And basically what a pollen basket is, is it's a smooth trough, um, basically surrounded by stiff, dense hairs. I wonder if, I don't think there's a way that I can, is there a laser pointer? Can you see it? Yes, we can see it. <gasps> ah, okay, great. So there's this trough, can you, perfect. Um, and it's surrounded by these dense, dense hairs. And as they go around, they start to pack pollen into that trough um, and they mix it with nectar in order to kind of create this fabulous pellet that sticks into that trough surrounded by those dense hairs so that they can basically carry that pollen back to their nest so that they can, you know, feed it to their young. Um, again, only bumblebees and honeybees have this pollen carrying mechanism, um, but that's one way that we sort that those two morpho groups. Um, we have those two morpho groups. So we have bumblebees on the left and honeybees on the right. Um, these two groups are both social bees. So um, they both have queens and they both have worker structures. And they um, basically what happens is um, honeybees are eusocial. So they have a hive structure um, in which they are all independently working for the queen. They all have different tasks. Whereas bumblebees have a much looser structure and they have a nest type structure. Um, they are both generalist feeding st uh, strategies, which means that they don't really care what flowers they're eating. They just want to feed on flowers. Um, they uh, bumblebees feed on 34 different plant species. That's how many we've seen them feeding on campus. So um, that's a huge amount of plant species um, that we've seen them. Just a huge varied diet. Um, similar honeybees, we've seen them have a, a hugely varied diet, 17 different plant families. Um, honeybees are uh, not native to uh, Washington. They're not native to the United States. They're native to Italy. Um, so it's, uh, we study honeybees, we include honeybees in our native bee studies, um, primarily to kind of record um, their com competition levels uh, with, you know, our native bees. And we have found kind of a, a, not a lot of competition. We found that they're, they're pretty, pretty low competition levels with our native bees, which is great to find. 
Um, but because they're non-native, it's actually interesting. Honeybees are considered livestock, actually. They're, they're considered similar on the, on the same category as cattle. Um, and if you were to find a, a, a honeybee hive out in the woods somewhere, that hive would actually be considered a feral hive rather than a wild hive, similar to a feral cat. It's very interesting. So, um, but again, we include them. Um, but yes, it's a very interesting thing. We have our two bees. These are both um, highly related, um, which is one of the reasons that they have the corbicula. They share that. Um, also, bumblebees and honeybees are the bees that you're probably going to see the most in your yard just because they're the most visible. They have bright colors, uh, they're largest. Um, so these are the things that you're going to probably see the most and they're going to be, again, the easiest to identify. So the second pollen carrying mechanism um, is called scopa. Um, and this is instead of that dense brush of hair and that uh, trough, this is instead a, uh, a kind of a fluff of hair. It's a, it's a fluffy brush um, that is instead of wet packed, it is dry packed. So instead of having this dense ball of pollen, they're kind of carrying around a, a kind of a paintbrush. Um, this actually is very interesting because this, this, believe it or not, makes these bees with scopa instead of corbicula better pollinators. Because what's happening is when you have a wet packed pollen ball, not a lot of pollen is falling off the next time they land on a flower. But when you are carrying around a fluffy paintbrush full of pollen, every time you land on the next flower, a lot of pollen is falling off and you're having a lot of pollen exchange. And so it's very interesting. Uh, and it's there's actually been some exploration in agriculture to see if we can use some bees with scopa rather than honeybees to actually pollinate orchards. And there's actually been um, actually some, some success using uh, something called, or a species called alfalfa bees to pollinate some orchards. And it's it's been very incredible. Um, I can, if people have questions about it, I'd, I'd love to, to talk about it uh, later, but it's been very successful. It's very sustainable for farmers. Um, they've actually, it saves them a lot of money. Um, so it's, it's, a, it's a great option, but uh, there's two places that bees have scopa. Um, I really wish that scientists would have named them different things because they are located in two different places and it confuses me, but they are both called scopa. Bees can have scopa on their legs and bees can have scopa on their bellies. So kind of on the underside of their abdomens, um, but both are called scopa. On the left, we have examples of bees with scopa on their legs. Um, you can see in the yellow photo on the top left, some bees have very, very fine little bits of scopa. It's not a lot of scopa. And you can see on the bottom right in the leg scopa, sometimes it's very fluffy. And on the right, on the abdomen, I tried to select photos as many as I could to really show that brush of hair underneath there. Sometimes with this type of scopa, it's hard to see all of their fluffy hairs on the underside of their belly. Um, but hopefully you can kind of see here kind of where they're hiding all of those pollen carrying hairs. So the next slides I organize, so we're going to see the, the last six um, morpho groups, and I organized them uh, in order of uh, feeding strategy. So we have some generalists and we have some specialists. So it's uh, based on how many flower families they tend to visit. Okay, so we have medium dark bees and tiny dark bees. And this is kind of, uh, these two groups are, 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 um, <laughs> are dump groups, essentially. There's a lot of groups or a lot of bees that fall into this group because there are a lot of bees that are very difficult to identify that fall into these groups. There are a lot of bees that are small. There are a lot of bees that are medium that don't fall into the other groups. So these are our catch-alls, essentially. If they are medium and they aren't in another group, they go here. 
if they're tiny and they don't go into another group, they fall here. But I really want to emphasize truly how tiny some of these bees are. And I really want to emphasize, I mean, how beautiful and how interesting some of these medium bees are. Um, specifically, I'd love to address, let me get my laser pointer out again. Here we go. So this, I'd love to show you because it's just, I find it so beautiful. This is an Andrena species, Andrena day here. And it has this beautiful hammerhead shaped head and this beautiful fluff, <laughs> fluffy mustache, which I think is lovely. And this wonderful, lovely pantaloon scopa, they're just carrying all their pollen. Um, and this, this flower, come on, where's my mouse? This flower is about an inch across. So you can imagine how tiny that bee is. So just wanna emphasize how small these tiny bees can get. This, uh, the purple one above it, that's a chive. So just uh, another reference about how tiny these, these bees can get. So these two bees, uh, these two groups are uh, the groups that carry their hairs on the undersides of their abdomens. These are the only two groups that do. Um, and these are both in the Megachylidae bee family. Um, so they're very related to each other. Um, the group on the left, even though they are called the metallic hairy belly bees, have some that are striped. You can see that on the bottom. And even though on the right, there are the striped hairy belly bees, some are metallic, which you can see on the bottom left there. Um, one of the distinguishing features between these groups are when they come out. The metallic hairy belly bees are some of the first bees we see of the season. First, 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 first. So we see them in March and we stop seeing them around June. And then we start seeing the striped hairy belly bees around June and we see them until October. And so it's very uh, cool to see them overlap for about two weeks in June and then never again. So one of the ways that we see them, um, again, the metallic hairy belly bees, we see them more generalist. They feed on whatever they can get early in the spring. And then the striped hairy belly bees, uh, they are more specialized. They still have, you know, a, a broad, you know, broader selection of plant families, but there's less available to them later in the fall. And, and we'll talk a little bit more about that in a little bit, but there's just less available to them. And then we have the last ones. We have the chap leg bees, which you might be able to tell why they're called the chap leg bees. They have wonderful pants. Their scopa are very, very fluffy. Um, they are exceptional specialists and they have only been seen feeding on two plant families. Um, one of those uh, plant families, we have only observed them on once. So that's pretty significant really. I mean, they really only feed on one plant family. Um, and then the metallic green bees, which are lovely and vivid and green, um, have only been seen on four plant families. Um, and two of those plant families are only a single observation. So these are lovely and lovely to find, um, but often um, are kind of things that we are, oh, look it, and then they fly away and we don't ever see them again, which is very nice to, it's a nice Easter egg. We like to see them. Um, so I want to talk a little bit more also about our campus care, right? So um, we have such vivid arrays of bees and morpho groups on our campus, not only because we have, uh, you know, wildlife areas and spaces, but we've specifically put in efforts to protect our native bees and pollinators and our wildlife. Um, our groundskeeper is very adamant about pushing for native perm or natural permaculture methods. So this is forcing, uh, or I guess less forcing of monoculture areas, trying to create more open wildlife space and mixed planting spaces. So if you come to the Bothell campus and visit sometime, we'd love to have you. I mean, please let us know if you want a tour or just come and visit yourself. Um, you'll see many areas that are no mow spaces. There's spaces that are, are a huge variety of mixed native and non-native plants. 
uh, grasses and things. And so we have our grounds team specifically watching and tracking for I mean, invasive and pest species, but otherwise letting nature uh, be sort of planted in mixed uh, areas for all our planting spaces. The benefits to this also has brought uh, some interesting ideas that we have more natural predators, right? So there's more spiders, birds, and wasps that actually uh, take out any sort of hazardous predators. We have lots of ladybugs. We have uh, a variety of other predatory insects too that, that you know catch and control potentially hazardous bugs and, and pest species. And then because of that too, we also have less intensive care needed on our campus, right? We have less mowing that's required. There's less uh, pruning that's specifically uh, there. We have native planting species areas specifically for native plants that often are more hardy in uh, various disruption elements from you know, our droughts and dry periods in the summer to our you know, colder winters. Our native plants are more adapted to surviving than non-native plants a lot of times. It makes it a little more adaptable in case any invasive pest or a, a you know, fungus or something comes in because then other plants are, uh, can take this places of any species that dies out or gets affected by this too. So we feel we've been really successful with you know, the, the pesticide free care in that sense. And it's been what, 17 years now. <clears throat> I also wanted to show this relatively quick, quickly. This is a lot of data to look at, but this is a map of our campus. Um, you can see the 522 highway at the bottom here. Um, uh, in the red, and then our road snakes through the center of campus with our large 58 acre restored wetland on the top uh, right here. So all of these numbered areas are actually uh, growing green planting areas. The, the grayish spots are usually our parking garages or our buildings. And so you can see how many different spaces have actual native or wild planting spaces in them, even throughout our entire campus space, right? And we, we don't even sample in the 58 acre wetland, but instead in these 31 locations of different types of habitat and growing zones too. Uh, we have everything from you know, uplands, coniferous forests, number 29. Um, we have a food forest. We have various uh, hedges and sort of field grassland areas. And so we try and track and see what bees and what other pollinators come to these different areas too, so that we can both see what is you know, providing space for them, but also seeing what sort of flowers and plants they actually follow and track, depending if they're generalists or uh, specialist species or morpho groups. Um, in our methods itself, I want to just kind of overview this to kind of show what we actually do and how we track bees. We have uh, three methodologies. Uh, I've been in charge of managing the time surveys and the pre-surveys. So weekly, we'd had students or volunteers come to our campus and actually track and see what pl flowering plants were in bloom at the time. Uh, we sample from uh, March to September. And so all summer we're tracking weekly on different types of plant species and types that are blooming and then checking where on campus that is. From there too, we have timed surveys. And so we actually track uh, a specific species of plants seeing what type of bees come to those plants uh, in a 10 minute, 10 minute period. <clears throat> recording abundance and diversity. Right? So how many bees of a certain morpho group come to the, the specific flower? Uh, and then also what how many different types of morpho groups arrive as well? Okay, so I do some photo survey methods um, and I am looking primarily at uh, a species list on campus. I wanna know what bee species make their homes here. And I wanna know what they're eating. I wanna know what plants they favor and I wanna know where they forage, what they're foraging on. Um, so I examine unique species interactions. So my surveys, um, I pick a area on campus. I use the map above that we just looked at, but I tweak it a little bit. Um, and I spend 40 minutes minimum in the area that I choose. Um, and I am looking at novel bee species visiting a novel flower species. So if I see a bee and it visits a daisy and it, that same bee goes and visits a daffodil, I will take that picture of that same bee. But if a bee, that, a friend of that bee of the same species goes and visits a daisy, I won't take that picture because I already have a picture of that species visiting a daisy for that day. So pretty much what I'm looking for is just trying to find whatever is out you know, looking at the plants that day, whatever they're eating, I just want to know what they're what they're munching on. Once I take 
all of my photos, which sometimes is upwards of 2,000 photos in a, in a survey, a 40-minute survey taking 2,000 photos is a little bit much, but later, once I delete all the blurries and I identify all the photos, I'll identify the plant species that they're feeding on and I'll identify the bee species as uh, far as I can. Uh, if it's to morpho group, that's as far as I can take it so be it. But if I can get it to genus or species, I will. That's great if I can. Um, and then I use that data for a variety of purposes. And it's not just me who uses that. I share that data with a variety of people on and off campus. Um, and we use it for a bunch of things. Um, I personally use it primarily for plant pollinator network analysis. Um, it's something that I personally am studying and it's my personal interest. Um, but we're also using it, something that's very big on our campus that we've been working on for a long time. And it's a big issue that we'll talk about, like I said, in a bit. We're leading up to it a whole bunch. But identifying bloom gaps on our campus has been a big, big deal. Um, and we use this data um, as part of one of the ways that we identify those. Um, we also use this as one of the tools uh, to inform future landscaping plans um, or current landscaping tools. Um, this data has been used in several student internships and capstone projects. Um, we have a online uh, database, a photo archive, uh, similar like if you were to go to a museum and they have all of those beautiful drawers filled with those specimens. Um, the idea is to have one of those similar, but with photos is something that we've been working on. Um, and we've also been working to identify phenology trends. So when are the bees out? Is it the same as last year? Did they come out earlier? Have they stayed out later? So we're trying to identify that as our climate changes as well. Um, and fun fact, all of the photos that we're seeing in this, uh, all the bee photos, at least, um, that we're seeing in this presentation were taken by me during the surveys, which is pretty cool. Um, and this is actually a diagram of that network analysis that I was saying I was so passionate about. I won't bore us with the details, but long story short, the bars on top are how many of each B group I've seen. So the width is how many obs observations I've made. Um, excuse me. Same on the bottom. Exactly the same number of uh, times those uh, bees have visited that flower. And then the width of the gray bars are how many times those bees have interacted directly with those flowers. So it's a pretty interesting thing. It's been fun to be able to use my research to, to find out what is happening on the Bothell campus specifically. Um, but yeah, it's been a, uh, really cool to see. So we're just continuing. Um, yeah, it'll culminate in some really cool stuff. So, Krista, there's a, there's, yeah, a question. there's a question in the chat. I don't know if you want to save it for the Q&A at the end or if you want to um, answer Oops. it quickly. Uh, what it's was from that? Kathy, Kathy Renner. It's a really quick question. What qualifications does one need to volunteer? None. There we go. Not a little, not, not a, even a little bit. Minimum. An interesting Zero. views, right? Yes. Perfect. <laughs> <laughs> All are welcome. Excellent. Thank you. Absolutely. Please, please come. Enthusiasm. That's your that's your prerequisite. So we want to show this slide at least so people can uh, identify it visually, but we're sharing this link with you all, uh, I believe either afterwards or if it's available for you. Uh, this is the pollinators native collected uh, collection in our digital archive through our library system. Uh, the library at UWB has, and Cascadia has um, a variety of digital archives of photos and documents available to the public uh, on the main website. And so all our collections of the best bee photos uh, representing you know, all the different morpho groups is available online for you to actually check out and observe and, and identify and see yourself later. So you can have some fun and look at different bees uh, throughout our archives later. We're excited. We're hoping to get them updated soon. That's something we're working on behind the scenes. We have a whole bunch more photos to add, which is cool. 
Uh, one other thing we want to feature and mention is some of our native plantings. Um, we mentioned that many bees are generalists, but we still want to try and promote native plants to, you know, again, support native pollinators on campus. And the Washington Native Plant Society actually partnered with us twice at this point to try and uh, support pollinators. Um, but in this last time, specifically for something called bloom gaps. Uh, one of the things Kristen has been able to identify primarily is finding that there are time periods when on campus certain areas in that map we showed off does not uh, do not have flowering plants actually in bloom for certain periods of the uh, summer season. So we found and identified you know, different areas and sections across campus that would actually have a need of adding new plants. And so we worked to add specific native plants to these areas that have uh, estimated bloom times where we identified gaps. Um, one of the things people don't realize, right, insects can fly, right? They can go long distances, people think. That's true for some bee species, but a tiny dark bee or maybe even medium dark bees can't go longer distances. They have maximum ranges that they can fly. If they can't find flowering plants for two weeks, those bees are starving. Maybe, maybe you're not even surviving in that period. So we're really hoping to try and uh, increase spaces of you know, continuous blooms throughout the full growing season. Uh, particularly with native plants versus, you know, ornamentals, which are mixed in throughout our campus landscape, but then also that way supporting native uh, pollinators that way in case they might starve. Well said. Yeah, when a tiny bee can only fly 300 yards, you know, that's, that's, not, a, that's not a long way, you know, so yeah, making it really intentional where we're planting, you know, where is missing things, you know, just seeing, just uh, paying attention is has been just so valuable in, in this research. That's why we highly encourage all of you, right, if you have gardens or places to plant, right, plant native plants, plant flowering and blooming plants that can bloom in different times of the year. You'll have interesting experiences with different types of bees, hopefully, that way, too. There's a comment in the, uh, uh, in the chat real quick that I think really relates to this and um, maybe, a, maybe an implicit question at the same time. Please. So David writes that, I let a, plant, a patch, rather, of overwinter kale go to flower in early spring and get lots of yellow striped bumblebees. I also have a patch of chives at the same time, which attract a red brown striped bumblebee, which does not go to kale. So I guess maybe the question is, why is that, why is that the case? Um, I don't know right off the top of my head what kale flowers look like, um, but there are different requirements for different flowers, basically, um, so bumblebees, for example, have different size tongues depending on the species. Some bees have long tongues and some bees have short tongues. And so if there is a specific species that is a long tongue bee versus a short tongue bee, it might not be able to reach the resources that a certain flower might put out. Um, and so it might specifically go to a different plant based on uh, what it's looking for. Um, so I, again, I, I can look up when we're doing Q&A at the end what a kale flower looks like and maybe give you a better answer. But that's my guess is that it's just they don't have the resources to, to and, snag and the nectar from that one. And different types of bumblebees could have the different types of tongue, right? Even even between this, the species of bumblebees within the morpho group might have yeah. that difference. Yeah, yeah. The kale actually has lots and lots of very tiny yellow flowers. Mm. It hundreds, I bet it hundreds you of bumblebees on it, but all, all the yellow ones. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I bet you that's exactly it then. Yeah, the, it's just the shape of the, the inflorescence, the, the shape of the flower itself, I bet you, is the, is the diff, deciding factor. So they're going, the yellow ones are going for the, the low hanging fruit, the ones that are really easy. And then the chives have lots left over. And so the, the other ones, they know that there's lots there. You know, they they know that the other the kale, you know, is going to be picked clean because the the other ones they can only go there. The chives they know, oh, these are going to be left for me because those other guys can't get to it. So they know that there's a, like a big payoff there, and so that's why they prefer to go to the chives because they uh, they know the kale's have been picked clean already. So I think in terms of usefulness as well, the the kale is right next to my blueberry bushes. And I got, oh. a, I, I got a really good, I got a really good bunk load of blueberries this year when a lot of people in the area didn't do very well because of the spring. <laughs> See, and that's another thing is when you plant things together, that interplanting is something that is so 
good and helpful. And, you know, when you, when you're strategic about that, that's one of the things that, that we do on campus to kind of minimize like our irrigation is that we really are strategic about what plants need the same thing. And, and what we're talking about now is what plants bloom at the same time. And so you can kind of coincidentally, you know, take advantage of pollination cycles. Like that's just such a smart thing. And you've got a great harvest of blueberries because you were smart about where you planted your kale. Um, that's just a great, I mean, I love that. That's fantastic. So absolutely, and that's fantastic. I want to be conscious of time. Uh, there's a another question oh. that's actually been upvoted, if you will, uh, in the in the chat. And so one's coming from Doris and it's uh, the other's coming from Edwin. And that is, are mason bees native? And Edwin wanted to second that question because having a non-sticking bee in the garden would be great. Native, mason bees are native. Yes, yes. We have, uh, let me actually see if we have anything on here. Yes, this is our last interesting slide. So yeah, we, uh, we can we can hang out here. This was our, our interesting and, and question slide. So perfect. Um, yeah, mason bees are native. Um, you can get mason bees from a variety of places around, or you can put a mason bee box out on your property and hope to entice um, wild or or from other mason bee boxes into your into your yard. Um, but yeah, they are native. There's a lot of variety of mason bees. So uh, if you go to a, a company or an organization that will um, rent, which is pretty interesting. Mason bees, generally you'll get a blue orchard bee is the is the species they use or another similar um, agricultural bee. Um, but there's a ton of bees around that are um, of the same, uh, Osmia is the genus, Osmia species, um, that are also, also mason bees. So they have a similar nesting technique, um, but are not uh, in that same kind of agricultural niche. Um, but will also come to that same bee box and sit, have that same behavior and will pollinate your, your yard in the very same way. So I'll, I'll fly through these bullets. I already said native bees and honeybees are living in har harmony. That's great. We have not seen any invasives on campus. No killer bees or murder hornets. We're great there. Um, I'll blow past the cuckoo bees because that's a whole complicated thing that I could talk about for hours. I want to go to grad school for cuckoo bees, so don't worry about that. Um, and then we could talk about Bombus vancouverensis for a thousand years too. So we'll 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 skip but that. Just too. to point out that uh, the Bombus Bombus vancouverensis is the bee up here in the top right corner. Yes, yes, Bombus vancouverensis top top right. Yeah, we have a couple more questions in the chat here. So one from Roxy, uh, which is, can you comment on how many plants we buy in nurseries now have um, neonicotinoids, and I'm not pronouncing that properly, and are therefore harmful to pollinators? Um, so that is a hard thing to, sometimes you have to do your homework. So um, neonicotinoids are something that you find uh, in a lot of Roundup products or miracle Grow products. Um, if you go to like a Home Depot, for example, and you see something, um, a beautiful flower, and you pick up it and it has this little tag and it says um, pre-treated or something or similar language. <clears throat> um, that language, even though it might not say insecticide, or it might not say, you know, neonicotinoid, or it might not say, you know, any of those words, that pre-treated plant it very likely has been pre-treated. The plant itself, not just the outside of the plant, but genetically, that plant has been, been created to be resistant and, and harmful to insects that that visit it, and so it's it's very difficult and and frustrating um, to to be out in the world and, and being you know, wanting to be responsible with the plants that you buy. Um, uh, again, I would personally recommend doing homework. I try personally to avoid buying plants from big box stores like Home Depot and Lowe's every time. Recently, at least, I have been at a Lowe's or a Home Depot, and I've been like, Look at this great flower, and I've wanted to buy it. I've, I've looked at it. I've, you know, pulled the, the tag out. I've looked on my phone, and I've been like, oh, I can't buy this. Um, 
there are some nurseries in the area that I'd highly recommend. Um, I know Flower World is great. I know Sky Nursery has been pretty good. Um, there's a bunch of others that are smaller and in, more independent. So I, I would visit more of an independent nursery personally if you can. Um, but otherwise, if you know Lowe's or Home Depot is your only option, I would just do your homework if, at all possible. So unfortunately, they don't make it easy for you. Smaller nurseries often will have someone that can help you answer these questions too directly, right? And looking for either organic or sort of more natural, untreated, un unaffected species, I guess. That's another good point. A Home Depot or a Lowe's is not going to have the same education in their in their employees. They just don't have the resources to do that. Second question in the chat I'm seeing, Kristen, is uh, what about colony collapse disorder? Um, so colony collapse disorder, um, I know a little bit less about um, just because my research is primarily about native bees, honeybees or something that I'm kind of just sort of tangentially knowledge about knowledgeable about but my understanding about colony collapse disorder is that there has been a lot of study around a lot the problems there's been a lot of study on how to control um, the varroa mite has been a big issue um, that was a parasite that was a big problem um, so my understanding is that it's improved um, but I can't really I don't want to be the authority to say it's great so <laughs> the thing we should mention for native bees, at least, is colony collapse disorder primarily affects honeybees, right? Ones that have worker bees, whereas mm -hmm. native bees and solitary bees don't have this issue because they don't have colonies. Yeah. So it's why it's important to support our native bees, because if what happens if suddenly all our honeybees do have colony collapse disorder in the area, then you'd still have pollinators to support your plants and, and pollinating you know, fruit and vegetables. Yeah, thanks, Stefan. Well said. Yeah, it's very important. Like, like I mentioned with the agricultural experiments with the alfalfa bees, you know, if, if honeybees do collapse, you know, having an, uh, an alternative, you know, and being able to have this pre-research, you know, the baseline data about having, you know, alfalfa bees as a, a, an alternative, you know, as, as a known option is so important. So... Uh, then the last question in the chat, we're slowly running out of time, is how many bees, uh, how many species of bees will sting humans? Uh, I believe most of them. Um, my, but I don't, I don't really, um, <laughs> I believe that all bees are capable of stinging except for specifically stingless bees that are, that are called stingless bees. But I actually don't, I don't know that. I'm surprised that I don't know that. Um, I've never been stung, um, except for as a child when I stepped on a bumblebee and I cried all the way home because I killed it and I was so sad. <laughs> um, yes, most bees won't, most native bees won't sting people. They're no. not generally aggressive, like certain hornets that we spoke about. Uh, no, they want nothing to do with you. That's right. That, as long as they, they leave bees in, in their own peace and their own space, you're usually fine. I have never experienced e any kind of aggression ever from any kind of bee. It, it, no, yeah. So I, I'm sure that they could theoretically, but... As, I mean, we in our research, right, we get it right up with cameras and our research is right up to honeybees and tiny dark bees, metallic green bees. None of our none of our students and volunteers, anyone has ever been stung while on research at this point. So I pick up bumblebees yeah, maybe, on a regular basis. Relatively friendly. I mean, we're <laughs> not you know bothering their hives or their nests if we find it right. We're trying to stay away from any you know activity they do, but we've been very close to all these different types of native bee morpho groups and had no trouble, no stings whatsoever so far. I think ultimately the rule of thumb is be respectful and they will be respectful, you know, so, yeah. I think that's a great note, just really quickly, because I know we're at the top of the hour. Um, I just wanted to say thank you um, to our fabulous instructors here um, and presenters for, you know, providing all this really, really great information. Um, again, Kristen Atberry and Stefan Klassen, thank you so much. This has been incredibly interesting. Um, I'm thinking of uh, volunteering myself at some point in time. Um, that could be a, a, a really great, uh, a really great thing to do.